This is the third lecture, a series of 22 lectures on the chaotic kingdom stage, the seventh stage in the Old Testament study. And I told you during the, the end of the last hour, the last study we had, that I wanted to take the first part of this lecture and uh, zero in on Elijah beside the brook Cherith. In order to review what we've already said, again, let me read the first few verses of chapter 17. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee from here, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, which is before the Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, which is beside the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass that after a while that the brook dried up, because there had not been no rain in the land. Since graduating from high school in 1950 in Quincy, Illinois, I've had the privilege of attending various schools, some 10 years of formal training from that period on. I enrolled in the early 50s in the, in the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago and graduated from that school, and so in those days I, uh, I wore a MBI sweatshirt, standing, of course, for Moody Bible Institute. And then I attended two colleges. I attended a little college in Southern Baptist College in Hannibal, Missouri, Hannibal LaGrange College. And so I took off my MBI shirt and began to wear an HLG, Hannibal LaGrange College. And then I finished college. That was a junior college. I finished college in another uh, school in Missouri, Culliver Stockton College in Canton, Missouri. So I uh, discarded then the MBI and the HLG sweatshirts, and I began to wear the CSC, Culliver Stockton College. And then I went to graduate school, attended Dallas Theological Seminary, and uh, then uh, my books, of course, were marked with the initials DTS, Dallas Theological Seminary. And finally, I had one year at Ashland Theological Seminary in Ashland, Ohio. So I then marked my books with the ATS, Ashland Theological Seminary. Do you know there was a period in my life of some two years that I was enrolled by the Lord Himself in a different kind of school, the initials of which were DBI, not MBI, or HLG, or CSC, or DTS, or ATS, but uh, DBI. And let me just briefly give my testimony concerning uh, my experiences and my assignments while I was in the DBI for some two years. It happened a number of years ago. And I had resigned from a certain church, and there had been a few problems and nothing extremely serious, but I just didn't feel God wanted me to continue on, and so I resigned that church. And I was called to candidate uh, in a very beautiful church in Cortland, New York, and I fell in love with the people right away, and it was uh, just a fine church, and they had a new parsonage, and so they gave me a unanimous call to come be their pastor. And I was really tempted to go because the people were so lovely and, and because, of course, I had resigned to one church and uh, I had developed a habit early in life of eating three times a day and my wife and son had sort of gotten along. Uh, they'd uh, had that same habit. And uh, there is a temptation, by the way, for a pastor uh, to take a church if for no other reason because of that paycheck. Now, he shouldn't do it, but there's a temptation to do that. And I really prayed about it, and the church was so gracious in allowing me uh, nearly 60 days to think it over. But the Lord definitely 
and pressed me to say no. And so very reluctantly, I didn't have any place to go, but I honestly didn't feel I could take a church simply because it was the only thing available. I would not take it, could not take it, unless I felt this is what God would have me do. So I told them that I did not feel I could accept the call. Well, it came time for us to leave that city where I was pastoring, and the people, of course, uh, had allowed us to stay in the parsonage for a few weeks longer, and uh, where I had been pastoring, and although they put no pressure on us, I felt definitely I should get out of the parsonage because of the next pastor uh, who they were considering calling, and so we determined, uh, at least I did, that uh, we would move to Wheaton, Illinois, and I would perhaps finish my degree at Wheaton Seminary. So we moved to Wheaton. Now, we'd been sort of babe in the woods for a number of years. I had not had the, I didn't have to worry about paying rent because normally a church would supply the parsonage. And I didn't realize how much rent was. Well, I make a long story short, when we moved in Wheaton, it seems like uh, all of uh, heaven itself was closed. And uh, I had $1,500 in the bank, and I went through that in about two weeks just moving me down there. And we had seven rooms of furniture, and we moved into four-room apartment. And I was paying, and that was a number of years ago, over $200 a month rent, and that was even today quite a bit of money. And uh, so God really then closed all the doors, because when I got there, I found that because of various circumstances, I could not arrange my schedule uh, to finish up at Ash or at uh, uh, Wheaton Seminary, and so there was no other church opened, and um, finally, we got where we didn't have any money, and so my wife said, what are you going to do? I said, well... I said, I'll tell you two things we're not going to do. We're not going to live off your folks or my folks. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. And I thought that would be fun. I said, I'll get a job in a, well, in construction or something. And I'll work a few weeks and, you know, build my muscles up. And sometimes pastors can get that middle age spread before they get their uh, middle age as far as time is concerned. And and uh, so uh, it'll be fun, you know, and clear my mind and, and I'll have a chance uh, to then probably God will open up some nice big church. Well, I finally secured a job in a factory working in Melrose Park, Illinois, uh, actually a suburb of Chicago, and I traveled about 17 miles right through the heart of Chicago traffic every day to work at this job in International Harvester Tractor Company. And that two or three week or month period that I had assumed so flippantly at the beginning uh, turned into almost two years. And I want to tell you, those two years in many, many ways were some of the most difficult months of all my life. I constantly went in debt. We tried our best to uh, write our creditors and tell them, well, we're just a little behind this month. And I did try to, eventually did get caught up on everything I owed, but God simply shut all doors. And uh, we were despondent and blue and discouraged. And often I would leave my wife uh, crying and she would be weeping and I'd be very angry, and I would say, now, woman, I don't want to hear that. God's going to take care of us and quit that crying. Then I would uh, get in my car and cry all the way to work myself. And, oh, God, I'd cry out, what have I done? Uh, how have I harmed you? What are you trying to show me or do to me? And I got to the place where I must admit I not only doubted the goodness of God but very frankly, you may not want to listen to any more tapes after I make this statement, but I got to the place in my life, I've been a minister now, where I not only doubted the goodness of God, I doubted the very existence of God. Maybe you've never done that. If you haven't, I suspect then that uh, Satan hasn't gotten a hold of you because uh, you can do a lot of things that you don't think you'll do. But uh, at any rate, I uh, I had a quite a time and. And of course, I was the last person to be hired by this factory, 
and I was always the first person to be bumped because of union, uh, you know, various uh, seniority rules. And so they put me on a big washer, and there I was. I used to think, well, Lord, you uh, allowed me first to baptize people, and now I guess you think so little of me that you're allowing me to baptize tractor parts and kerosene. And that's what I was doing, and it began to eat up my skin, and I had looked like I was a leper, and inside I felt even worse. And... Uh, well, it just went on and on, and, and nothing seemed to open up. And finally, uh, there I was. Uh, I try, uh, tr so I tried to get another job. I thought I'll work two jobs. And so I got on another job at uh, working 16 hours a day, and still not really able to catch up with my debts, and no money saved, and uh, no hope of saving any money. And I, uh, I'd be cussed out by the foreman and covered with oil and and oh, how I felt sorry for myself. And finally, I was, uh, after about 10 bumps, as it were, I, I was bumped to uh, a night shift, a midnight shift, going to work at 11 o'clock at night and getting off at 7 in the morning. And I was uh, just a janitor sweeping the floors. And I remember one morning, about 3 in the morning, I was feeling, as a usual, sorry for myself. And there I was sweeping that aisle with a broom, and suddenly the, the silliness, at least I felt at the time, the, the craziness, the illogic of the thing just fell upon me like a ton of bricks. And, and I just shouted out. I said, you are a preacher. You are called by God. What in the world are you doing sweeping with that broom? And I threw it down in disgust. And and almost as if I heard a voice from heaven, I really didn't audibly, but I certainly did hear God speaking the shouting to my heart. And he seemed to say, because I put you there, that's why. Now pick that broom up and keep sweeping that floor. Well, that's what I did. And you know, shortly after that, in order to really keep my sanity, I determined I'll make a study of the word of God. I got so I wouldn't even read the Bible. Oh, I would uh, make sure my boy and family uh, had their devotions and I would uh, go to church, but I began to question a lot of things about the goodness and the very existence of God, as I said. So at any rate, uh, I had a few hours to spare in the evening. I'd get my work done. And so I went to the superintendent and I said, uh, I'd like to get permission from you. When I get my work done, would you mind if I brought my Bible and read it? And he looked at me like I was putting him on. And he said, are you serious, son? I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, well, he said, uh, sure. Uh, you know, he said, it's a lot better, I suppose, than Playboy magazine and some of these filthy uh, magazines that the other fellows uh, read. He said, I don't care as long as you get your work done. He said, by the way, he said, uh, are you thinking of uh, going into the ministry? And I said, well, uh, you know, the thought had entered my mind. I didn't tell him I'd been a minister for a number of years before that. I, I guess I just didn't want anybody to know. So uh, at any rate, I began studying the Word of God uh, two or three hours a night. And, and during that time, I felt led by the Lord to do a study on the life of Christ. I'd never really gone into his life. And I became captivated by it. And not only did I work on it during those long nights, when I had my other work done, but I uh, would get up uh, a couple hours early during the day. I had to sleep during the day and I worked during the night. And at every spare moment that I had, I worked on the life of Christ. What a blessing it was. And well, at any rate, uh, I finished uh, about a 200 page summary. And then a few years went by. Of course, right after that, God began to open up some doors marvelously. But what I'm trying to say is a good friend of mine, Dr. Elmer Towns, at that time, I was teaching in Deerfield, Illinois, at the Trinity Seminary. So I had lunch with him. I'd known him for a number of years, and he said, Harold, I've resigned from Deerfield. I said, well, I didn't know that, Elmer. He said, yes. He said, and I'm taking uh, a position with Dr. Jerry Falwell. I said, who? He said, well, he said, he has a church in Lynchburg, Virginia. And I said, where? Well, I'd never heard of Jerry or... Uh, Lynchburg or the Thomas Road uh, Baptist Church. And uh, so uh, before he went, he said, say, he said, have you have you uh, written any books lately? 
because he knew that uh, I loved to write. And I said, well, Elmer, I said, I some a few years ago, I did a study on the life of Christ. He said, I'd like to look at it. So he took it and read it and didn't say anything, gave it back to me. And then he went on down to Lynchburg and he hadn't been down there very long. And I got a phone call saying, listen, we'd like to invite you uh, to come down. This was actually during the winter, I think, of 1971. He said, I've been pastoring a few years at that time in Indiana. He said, we'd like for you to come down and hold a series of meetings on the life of Christ in the college. Lynchburg, in those days, it was Lynchburg Baptist College. Well, I was thrilled because by that time I'd found out who Jerry Falwell was in the great ministry of Thomas Road. So I came down and I spoke three times a day for five days and gave a 15-hour summary on the life of Christ. Well, unknown to me, the main reason that that uh, Towns and Falwell had me come is that they had in mind of starting a Bible Institute in September of that year. That would have been actually in 72. And uh, Dr. Towns thought I might be the man for it, but they wanted to hear me out. And so the students were very gracious about uh, going to Jerry uh, as a group and say, look, we feel this is the man. Why don't you invite him to come? Well, I was the last one to find out about it. And so Jerry took me to lunch on that Friday and asked if I would come to the Institute. And uh, so I didn't even uh, feel I should pray about it. I just was sure that was not God's will. He called me to be a preacher, not a teacher. And and uh, so to make a long story short, though, after a lot of prayer, uh, oh, about four months later, it took me uh, many months to pray about this. And Jerry and flew me down several times, and I preached to Thomas Road, and Dr. Towns drove to see me on one occasion, and so I finally came. But, you know, the thing that really God used to bring me to Thomas Road was that oil-stained and blood-stained, I kept cutting my finger, I guess, when I was working there, perspiration-stained and sometimes tear-stained manuscript that I did while I was enrolled my two-year sojourn at the DBI, the Drying Brook Institute. What I'm trying to tell you through this testimony is that in my 18 years in the ministry before I came to Thomas Road, I learned a lot about people. Since that time, I've learned a lot about myself. But, you know, I know I'm speaking to pastors and missionaries and We have people by the thousands. We have well over 2,000 already enrolled in the Liberty Home Bible Institute. And I know there are a number that are listening to this tape now. And brother or sister, you're going through uh, a siege of torment and turmoil and confusion. And uh, you're doubting the goodness of God. You may be even doubting the very existence of God And you want to throw down the broom and cry out, what in the world am I doing here? I want to tell you, pick that broom up and keep doing what you're doing now. That is to say, if you have no control over what you are, what you're doing now, because God is allowing you the privilege, brother or sister, to go through the DBI. That's far more important than graduating from any college or any university. These colleges and universities, thank God for them, they're important. But I want to say that I learn more about Jesus and about the Lord and about myself and about other people during my two-year sojourn, as we said before, enrollment in the Drying Brook Institute. You see, later on, God is going to allow His prophet to stand on Mount Carmel and single-handedly defeat 450 priests, the priests of Baal. And he's going to lead God's people in a great revival. The greatest moment in his life, as far as men are concerned, will take place in 1 Kings chapter 18. But as far as God's concerned, the greatest moment, I believe, was in 1 Kings 17 because the Mount Carmel experience is almost always preceded by the drying brook experience. If you're going through that time that I went through and that Elijah went through and millions of believers have gone and are going through, then I would say to you, 
rejoice and be exceedingly glad because God has some great Mount Carmel experience for you. The only reason I give this is because my students have come to me over the years and told me of all the illustrations I've ever been led to use, that God has blessed that one to their own hearts more than any others. And dear friend, I hope that it will bless your heart too. I know what some of you may be going through, but God never makes a mistake. And God is never painted in a corner. And if you'll humble, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, God will do something great and grand and glorious in your life. All right. Now, after a while, the Bible says in verse 7, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So what does God do now? He moves him out. And I suppose Elijah feels he's learned all the lessons that he can learn now. And now it's going to be a worldwide ministry again for him. But unknown to Elijah, God still has a little postgraduate work that he wants Elijah to enroll in, a few more courses. And so we read in verse 8, The word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to sustain thee. Well, he goes there. Now, this is really hard on his pride. First of all, he has to depend upon some ravens and birds to supply him food and watch a, a muddy brook dry up, and that was bad enough. But uh, now he's pretty well dependent upon an older lady and her young son in order to provide him with food. Now, here's a rugged mountain man. Here's an independent critter, as it were. And he doesn't like to subject himself uh, to depending upon this woman. But God says, you go and and uh, you reside in her home. She'll have a place for you upstairs, sort of a prophet's chamber. And you stay there because I have some more lessons that I want you to learn. And, of course, uh, while he's there, he finds out, or as he visits that, he finds uh, the home. He finds that the woman is um, affected by the drought, as all other uh, women uh, and men were in those days, and she's about ready to starve along with her young son. And uh, so God tells Elijah to comfort her and to tell her if she'll honor the prophet by giving him a part of the last meal uh, that she has and bake him a little cake that God will take care of her from that point on. And he did. And the Bible says that the barrel of meal, just a little handful in that barrel left when Elijah came, but God allowed it to continue all through those next two, three years. The barrel of meal was not used up, neither was the cruise of oil. Did the cruise of oil fail? When Elijah came, she had just a few drops of oil left. According to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. And in verse 17, something very, very significant happens. The child, the only child of this widow woman died. And he's, uh, she's so concerned now. And she says in verse 18, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? In your notes, you'll have this, that this points out two things. The testimony of Elijah, she calls him a man of God. Here's a woman who sees Elijah before he had his first cup of coffee in the morning, as it were, and when he was discouraged and before he'd really combed his hair, and, and uh, yet she could still call him a man of God. There are two people on this earth that could probably tell you more about my spirituality than any other two individuals. If you really want to know what kind of Christian uh, Wilmington is, you might ask Jerry Falwell, or you might ask Elmer Towns, or you might ask some of my students and some of my professor friends, perhaps some of the people that I've worked for or some of the people that now work for me. But if you really want to know what kind of a uh, child of God I really am, then I would suggest that you ask one of two individuals, 
either my wife, Sue, or my son, Matthew. They can tell you more than any other person because they see me as I really am. The acid test of a man or a woman's Christianity is what the opinion that his loved ones have him that see him every day. There is a song that I love to hear sung, and it goes like this. Earthly pleasures vainly call me, I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. Now notice, in the home and in the throng, be like Jesus all day long, I would be like Jesus. And I want to tell you, it's far easier on some occasion to be like Jesus in the throng, that is to say when you're with people, than it is in the home. But the song says, be like Jesus all day long. So it calls out the, points out the testimony of Elijah and also her uneasy conscience. The woman says, are you come to torment me because of my sin, some secret sin that she may have done? She felt now God was catching up. But uh, at any rate, the Bible says that Elijah carries this lad upstairs he stretches himself upon the lifeless body three times and prays that God would raise him from the dead. Now we have one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible, this chapter here, because it tells us for the first time in human history, the first time a dead body is raised to life. And you know, who would have thought that an ex Brook squatter would have done this. Elijah raises a dead body back to life. Of course, later on, there are eight occasions in the Bible where we have a resurrected uh, event mentioned, not counting the resurrection of Jesus. That was an entirely different one because Jesus was the only person ever to be raised from the dead, never to die again. I might just stop here and say that... Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus is referred to by the Apostle Paul as the first fruits of the resurrection. And uh, some have questioned that. Well, I don't understand. Elijah raised a boy from the dead, and later on others would. And Jesus himself raised three. Why is his resurrection called the first fruits? Well, because, as I said, uh, his was the first that did not die. There was to say, did you ever hear a message on the second funeral of Lazarus, for example, we know a lot about the first events of the first funeral, Lazarus and Mary and Martha and Jesus and the rest. But do you know that he died again? Lazarus died again. And uh, this time, Jesus did not come and raise him from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus is a totally different uh, event. But Elijah raises the first, and then later on, Elisha will be instrumental, his successor, in raising two. And uh, that gives us a total of three, and that's really all you find in the Old Testament, three resurrections. And then in the Gospels, there are three more raised by Jesus. He raises the daughter of Jairus. He raises the son of a widow in name, and he raises Lazarus. And then in the book of Acts, you have two more. Uh, Simon Peter and the Apostle Paul will both raise people. And this gives us a total of eight. But the first one was raised by a graduate, folks, of the DBI, Drying Brook Institute. All right, now, after he has done this, in chapter 18, verse 1, he's ready now for Mount Carmel. It's taken a long time, some three and a half years, according to the book of James, this drought lasted for three and a half years, and it's a, it started in 1 Kings 17. It's about to end now, so we're talking about a long period of time. It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And uh, so on his way to confront Ahab, he meets a backslidden prophet, by the name of Obadiah. 
Now, this is not the same Obadiah that later on would write the book of Obadiah. That's an entirely different fellow who lived and ministered in an entirely different uh, time. But here is a man of God. He's saved, but he's backslidden, and he's not really taking a stand for the Lord. So uh, he knows Elijah, and boy does he ever know him, because Ahab is trying to find Elijah, and the reason being is that uh, Ahab realizes Elijah has caused this plague, and so there's uh, all kinds of posters, uh, APBs out on him, all point bulletins, to arrest him dead or alive. So he comes uh, sauntering along, and hello there, uh, Obadiah, what's happening? And Obadiah is scared to death. He said, man, if, if Ahab gets a hold of you, he said, say, by the way, that's the guy I want to see. And uh, he said, you tell your master, Ahab, I understand you've got a pretty soft job now working for Ahab. You tell him that uh, I want to see him. And Obadiah just scared to death. And when Ahab finds out that he even knows about uh, Elijah, he might kill both of them. And so before he uh, goes any further, though, the uh, a, uh, Obadiah attempts to prove and convince Elijah that he's a spiritual man. He said, you know, he said, I don't think people appreciate what I do. He said, have you heard what I've done? Verse 13, was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men in the Lord's prophets? by 50 in a cave and fed them bread and water. And, uh, you know, I've been a pretty spiritual fellow. Well, when a man starts attempting to convince you of his spirituality, probably the fellow is unspiritual and he's really trying to convince himself. And Dr. Bob Jones Sr., I think, preached a message on this on one occasion. And said, what are these prophets doing hiding in a cave? If they are prophets of God, they ought to be out proclaiming the message of God and not hiding in a cave. And, and he looked down and saw verse 13. It says, they were fed bread and water. He said, that serves them right. He said, God's people deserve cake and steak when they're doing what God wants them to do. But these prophets may have been somewhat backslidden like Obadiah. But at any rate... Uh, God tells Elijah to present himself before Ahab. And in verse 17, he does just this thing. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he who troubleth Israel? Now you see, here's what he's trying to do, what sometimes liberals try to do today. They try to blame the fundamentalist, the Bible believers, the evangelical Christian for all the ills in America. For example, they say, well, the reason we have so much crime and corruption and uh, juvenile delinquencies, everything, is because uh, the police are too brutal, you know, and we've emphasized the biblical law and order concept too much. Well, there may be police brutality, but I'll tell you there's a lot of criminal brutality too. And uh, you can't blame the Bible believer for all the crime in the streets on the fact that because that we preach a devil's hell and we sort of accept people. Or they'll say, well, the reason for all the sexual problems and the promiscu promiscuity that we have today is because of our old Victorian hang-ups and our Puritan forefathers who thought it was terrible if uh, a lady would even expose her ankle or something. And so the pendulum is swung now. And, and well, that's nonsense, of course. Uh, I agree with Billy Graham who said on one occasion that the new morality is nothing else but the old immorality. But here Ahab attempts to do what sometimes liberals and sociologists like to do. They attempt to pin the blame on God's people. Well, he will have none of this, though. In verse 18, Elijah answered, I have not troubled Israel but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Someone has said, if you spit in the wind, you spit in your face. If there's anything, any principle that the Bible teaches, teaches many, but it is this, that the wages of sin is death. 
Someone has said there will be no reduction in the wages of sin. Somebody else has said that many unbelievers and believers alike sow their wild oats all week and then go to church on Sunday and pray for a crop failure. It doesn't work that way, though. What sort of a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so uh, Ahab and Israel had simply been, been sowing, or reaping, I should say, what they had sowed for so many years. Now, in the next few verses, Elijah proposes a contest here. And uh, what he wants Ahab to do is uh, to meet on Mount Carmel along with the false prophets of Baal and uh, have a fire-consuming sacrifice contest, as it were. And there were several rules laid down. Number one, two bullocks or ox would be sacrificed and laid upon two altars, one dedicated to Baal and the other to God, because the Baalites, some of the false religions copying after the true religion by Israel, uh, as laid down by Israel, would often sacrifice animals to pagan gods. And so they were familiar with this sacrifice. And he said, all right, let's do that. And uh, we'll build two altars. And then both deities would be prayed to. The priest would pray to Baal. And Elijah would pray to God. And then uh, the real God, that would be the contest. Will the real God please stand up, you see? And the real God could prove himself by sending down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. And I don't think... Um, Ahab wanted to go along with this at all, but uh, he was sort of conned into it, and so he agrees. And so, verse 20, Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah preaches a little sermon to him now, right before he starts. He says to them, How, halt, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Don't be both. You can't serve God and Manum. You know, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, the Bible says, Jesus himself, I should say, says to a backslidden Laodicea church, he said, I would that thou art either, were either hot or cold. He said, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. God has more respect, I believe, for some who will come out against him that he does for some who won't, uh, you know, they just won't say anything. As I'm making these tapes, uh, a presidential election is on. This is 1976, while the second semester tapes are being finished. And uh, President Ford and Jimmy Carter. And they're accusing one of the candidates of sort of flip-flopping, flip-flopping, as it were, between uh, opinions, uh, almost like... Uh, the Israelis are doing, uh, were doing uh, some uh, seven centuries B.C. Remind me of a politician, by the way, you know, that takes a stand on any issue according to how many votes he'll get him. And so there's one very controversial, controversial issue. And, and uh, so he made a speech on that. He said, now listen, <clears throat> he said, some of my best friends are 100 percent for this particular issue. And he said, some of my Best friends are 100% against this issue. And he said, I want to tell you where I stand and make my position perfectly clear. He said, I'm for my friends. <laughs> so apparently uh, Israel, uh, were they just didn't have the nerve to determine to follow Baal or Jehovah. And uh, Elijah now is going to force the issue. So he gathers all the people, preaches to them, and uh, then the contest begins. He allows the priest to take first shot at it. And uh, so we find them doing this here in verse 26. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning until even, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar, which was made. And it came to pass at noon. They've worked all morning now, and they can't seem to arouse Baal. 
that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or maybe he's on the telephone somewhere. You know how those gods are. Once they get on the phone, they like to talk. And uh, maybe he's talking or pursuing or he is in a journey. Maybe he's another galaxy. Or perhaps he's sleeping. You know, some of those gods are pretty lazy and must be awakened. Well, the more he mocked them, uh, the more they cried out. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with swords and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past that they, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice and there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. Do you know, regarded. Do you know I think that chapter 18 and verse 29 is one of the saddest verses in all the Bible. There was none, neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. A number of years ago in Minneapolis, Minnesota, there was a, about the same time of the God is Dead movement. Uh, there was an article uh, written by a believer, a Christian, into, uh, and was sent to the editor of Minneapolis uh, Star newspaper. And uh, the article said, uh, in effect, God is dead. How strange. I just talked to him this morning. Well, a few days later, an agnostic read that letter and thought he'd have some fun. And so he sent a similar letter into the editor. And this editor, uh, this letter said, a Buddha is dead. How strange. I just talked to him this morning. And uh, so the first person who wrote the Christian who wrote the first letter in the who wrote the letter in the first place, I should say, wrote back. And I thought he answered in a masterful way. He said, what did he say to you? You see, the difference between Christianity and all other so-called religions, we have someone that not only can we pray to, but someone who can speak to us. Have you talked to the Lord this day? One of the saddest poems I think I've ever heard is a poem that goes like this. It's concerning the loneliness of life without Christ. Oh, to have no Christ, no Savior. How lonely life must be, like a sailor lost and driven on a wide and shoreless sea. Oh, to have no Christ, no Savior, no hand to clasp thine own through the dark veil of shadows. Thou must press thy way alone. At the completion of this poem, we'll conclude this tape. And the next tape will then get back into the life of Elijah. God bless you.